Well, good afternoon. My name is Dan Churchwell, and it's my privilege to welcome Dr. Alan Gelzo to the Acton Institute. Dr. Gelzo is one of the nation's foremost experts on Abraham Lincoln and Lincoln's era. Serving as the director of Civil War Era Studies and the Henry Luce Professor of Civil War Era at Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania. He earned it both his MA and PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, and he is able to speak with authority on the historical, political, economic, and religious ideas that made for such a tenuous time in American history. He has authored or edited over 16 books with his 2013 book, Gettysburg, The Last Invasion, becoming a New York Times bestseller. His most recent work is on the period of reconstruction after the Civil War. It's also for sale in the back, and there will be a book signing near the end of the event. Among his many honors, I love this one, he's the 2010 Grammy Award-nominated uh, speaker for his part in a BBC audio production of the entirety of the Lincoln-Douglas debates uh, that was produced by David Strathairn and Richard Dreyfus. So I think it's the first uh, Grammy-nominated uh, speaker we've had at Acton, so kind of fun. Most recently, he was awarded the prestigious Bradley Prize, which recognizes individuals of extraordinary talent whose accomplishments reflect the Bradley Foundation's mission to restore, strengthen, and protect the principles and institutions of American exceptionalism. I have also heard, on good account, that uh, he has a Lincoln vignette for almost any situation or circumstance that someone might find himself in. So please, without further ado, welcome Dr. Alan Gelzo. Well, I don't know if I have a Lincoln vignette for every situation, but I will say that I am happy once again to be in Grand Rapids, happy once again to be in Michigan, which is the home state of my wife. She comes from Lapeer County, the other side of the state. But I am very closely bound up with Wolverines of all sizes and descriptions. Uh, most of my in-laws uh, are Michiganders. So being in Michigan is uh, a little bit like being in a kind of second home. So it's good to be back in Michigan, good once again to visit here in Grand Rapids. There are people here that I know, and I'll single out just a couple. Uh, one is uh, Jim Voss. Jim, where are you hiding? There you go. Jim Voss did something extraordinary about four or five years ago. He emailed me totally out of the blue. He entitled the email, Shooting for the Moon. He is a, a teacher at the uh, Grand Rapids Christian Middle School. And every year, he brings his class as, a, I think, a reward for their academic effort to Gettysburg, to the battlefield. He asked, out of the blue, if I'd be willing to meet with his class and talk to them. Well, I looked at my schedule, and I said, oh, well, I, that seems to be perfectly fine. Now, I think he was half afraid that I was going to respond with the sort of response that you get in The Wizard of Oz, like, nobody gets to see the great Oz. Nobody, no how, no way. <laughs> but, uh, I, but I said, oh, yeah, sure, come on. And, in fact, we've been doing it now uh, every year in succession, uh, every April. So that's been fun to do. Jim, it's good to see you on your home turf, no less. He keeps me well supplied with Wilhelmina peppermints. Um, a fellow Lincolnite introduced himself to me, Bruce Tapp, and it was fun to see. I haven't seen Bruce in a number of years, but Bruce also is a laborer in the Lincoln Vineyard, and it's a pleasure to see uh, Bruce again here. So there are all kinds of people that I'm happy to meet here, and sometimes it's old friends, and sometimes we're going to make some new ones. Back in May of 2010, I had an email from a Princeton political science professor, who shall remain nameless, who picked up a copy of a pamphlet printed under the auspices of the American Constitution Society, which featured in one handy format the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Gettysburg Address. 
Now, the American Constitution Society is, so to speak, the political progressives alternative to the Federalist Society. Even so, my friend was surprised to read through the text of the Gettysburg Address in this pamphlet and feel that somehow something was not quite right about it, since it read that we here highly resolve that this nation shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. After a moment of slightly confused reflection, he realized what was bothering him. The ACS version of the Gettysburg Address had omitted the phrase, under God. What Lincoln actually said at Gettysburg on November 19, 1863 was that we here highly resolve that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Being a fair-minded man, my colleague wondered briefly if this was simply a glitch. After all, of the five copies of the address which survive in Lincoln's own hand, two of them also omit the phrase, under God. But then, with the help of a little more reflection and the assistance of an unidentified history professor from central Pennsylvania, he realized that of the two copies without under God, one was the copy Lincoln read from on the platform, but upon which Lincoln performed numerous improvised revisions, while the other was a preliminary draft replaced by a copy which did include under God. He also was led to understand that the Associated Press reporter who took down Lincoln's words as he spoke them, the Boston Advertiser reporter Charles Hale, and the Philadelphia Press reporter John R. Young, also included the phrase, under God, in their transcripts of what they heard Lincoln say. And that the three versions of the address which Lincoln wrote out afterwards all contained the phrase, under God. So it was hard for my friend to avoid the conclusion that the American Constitution Society's version had simply airbrushed under God out of the address as an inconvenience. Still, people really have wondered just how much Abraham Lincoln himself was under God or what he could have meant when he said that this nation should consider itself as being under God as it strove for a new birth of freedom. Lincoln, after all, has been the only president, along with Thomas Jefferson, never to have formally joined a church. There is no indication that he was ever baptized, ever took communion, or ever joined in public prayers. And this was not because he was ignorant of such obligations. He was raised in a particularly strict and devout family. His parents were members of a small Calvinistic Baptist sect. And he certainly had enough of the Bible dinned into his head at an early age that in later years he could give most preachers fairly good competition at identifying scriptural citations. In 1846, a minister passing by one of Lincoln's political meetings gave Lincoln a little good-natured heckling and remarked that, where the great ones are, there will the people be. Mr. Lincoln replied, Ho, parson, a little more scriptural. Where the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. <laughs> that from Matthew chapter 24. In 1864, when Lincoln was up for re-election, and a dump Lincoln movement had emerged within his own party around John Charles Fremont, Lincoln noticed that the reports of a pro-Fremont convention in Cleveland included a head count of about 400 delegates. Lincoln picked up a Bible and unerringly went to the text in 1 Samuel 22, which he thought best described the Fremont movement. And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt 
And every one that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. <laughs> Knowing the Bible, however, is not the same thing as subscribing to it, though. Nathaniel Grigsby, whose brother married Lincoln's sister while the Lincolns lived in Indiana, explained to Lincoln's law partner, William Henry Herndon, that I cannot tell you what his notions of the Bible were. He was a great talker on the scriptures and read it a great deal, and he talked about religion as other persons did, but I do not know his view on religion because he never made any profession while in Indiana that I know of. Orville Hickman Browning, one of Lincoln's closest political friends, recalled that during the White House years, Lincoln frequently spent Sunday afternoons in the White House library reading the Bible. But, added Browning, himself a devout Presbyterian and Bible reader, he never knew of Lincoln engaging in any other act of devotion. He did not invoke a blessing at table, nor did he have family prayers. What religious devotions may have been customary with him, I do not know. I have no knowledge of any. Even the Lincoln children's babysitter in the White House, Julia Taft Bain, remarked that Lincoln read the Bible quite as much for its literary style as he did for its religious or spiritual content. He read it in the relaxed, almost lazy attitude of a man enjoying a good book. In fact, take Lincoln back into his young adult years as a store clerk in New Salem, Illinois, and as a beginning lawyer in Springfield, Illinois in the 1830s. And Lincoln might not have seemed to think that the Bible was even a good book. The young Lincoln bolted from his father's farm and his father's control as soon as he turned 21. And once on his own, he rejected very nearly everything his father had stood for, including Christianity. John Todd Stewart, who was Lincoln's first mentor and first partner in practicing law, described the 20-something Lincoln as an avowed and open infidel who sometimes bordered on atheism. Lincoln went further against Christian beliefs and doctrines and principles than any man I ever heard. Stuart was shocked to hear Lincoln hold forth on the inherent defects so-called of the Bible and deny that Jesus was the Son of God as understood and maintained by the Christian world. Lincoln's unbelief was known broadly enough that in 1847, when he ran for Congress, his opponent, a circuit-riding Methodist preacher, Peter Cartwright, fanned up popular unease in the Illinois 7th Congressional District about an unbelieving candidate, to the point where Lincoln had to issue a public statement admitting that I am not a member of any Christian church, but denying that he was an open scoffer at Christianity. Maybe not an open scoffer, but certainly a private one. James Matheny, who stood up as the best man at Lincoln's wedding in 1842, remembered that Lincoln used to talk infidelity in the clerk's office in Springfield, where Matheny was the deputy clerk of the Illinois Supreme Court, about the years 1837 to 40, and ridiculed the Bible and New Testament. It was also no secret that he was not only not a member of any Christian church, but rarely darkened any of their doorsteps. One irritated Springfield Presbyterian minister wrote that Lincoln usually spent Sunday mornings at the railroad shop and spends the Sabbath in reading newspapers and telling stories to the workmen. Not, we might say, the kind of man who would be eager to put his nation under God. And yet, Lincoln's unbelief was more in the nature of a reaction than a conviction. He might have the natural-born debater's pleasure at rocking the boats of the pious, but he spoke of his own lack of religion with regret rather than boasting. 
He was sufficiently alienated from his father, Thomas Lincoln, that when the old man lay dying in 1851, Lincoln declined a summons to his father's bedside. But he did not mock the consolation that his father's religion held out. Tell him, Lincoln wrote to his stepbrother, that our great and good and merciful maker will not turn away from him in any extremity. He notes the fall of a sparrow and numbers the hairs of our heads, and he will not forget the dying man who puts his trust in him. When Parthenia Hill, the wife of one of Lincoln's business associates in New Salem, accosted him and asked, Do you really believe there's no future state? Lincoln's reply was almost regretful. Mrs. Hill, I'm afraid there isn't. It isn't a pleasant thing to think that when we die, that is the last of us. In midlife, Lincoln was even willing to speak of himself as a sort of religious seeker, a seeker who had not yet found and was not convinced he would find anything. Probably it is to be my lot to go on in a twilight, feeling and reasoning my way through life as questioning, doubting Thomas did, he told Aminda Rogers Rankin. But in my poor, maimed, withered way, I bear with me as I go on a seeking spirit of desire for a faith that was in him of olden time, who in his need, as I and mine, exclaimed, Help thou my unbelief. Whether this was a true confession or simply a generous way of throwing an annoying inquirer off the scent is something that we are never likely to know. Lincoln was not a man given to much self-revelation. Judge David Davis, who presided over the courts on the Illinois Eighth Judicial Circuit where Lincoln practiced, told William Henry Herndon that the idea that Lincoln talked to anyone about his religion or religious views is absurd to me. I knew the man so well. He was the most reticent, secretive man I ever saw or expect to see. What was not up for question, though, was Lincoln's reputation for honesty, dealing in a strictly above-board fashion with people. The same Springfield clergyman who complained about Lincoln's Sunday habits also conceded that all, although Lincoln makes no pretensions to piety, he is probably as moral as most persons who discard religion entirely in their practice. Among his fellow lawyers, Mr. Lincoln's character for professional honor stood very high. The entire framework of his mental and moral being was honesty, Herndon remembered, open, candid, and square in his profession, never practicing on the sharp or low. Herndon watched him in the law office warn clients who came with shaky or shady cases. You are in the wrong of the case, and I would advise you to compromise, or if you cannot do that, do not bring a suit on the facts of your case because you are in the wrong and surely be defeated and have to pay a big bill of costs. This was true in more than matters of simple truth-telling and advice. David Davis remembered that Lincoln was a man of strong passion for women, and this was a dangerous attribute in a man who had to deal with many issues which left women standing alone before the law. But his conscience kept him from seduction, added Davis, and this saved many, many a woman. Lincoln might not subscribe to church creeds, said Leonard Sweat, another fellow lawyer and, and another faithful Presbyterian layman, but he certainly believed in the great laws of truth the rigid discharge of duty, his accountability to God, the ultimate triumph of right, and the overthrow of wrong. Now, it may be difficult to imagine exactly how someone could believe in the great laws of truth while having no certainty in the existence or person of a divine truth giver. 
But law exists in the very fabric of nature, whether we believe or not in the author of that law. Just as it exists on the turnpike, whether or not we believe that there are state troopers lurking under the overpass. Even Thomas Jefferson, no great stickler he for Orthodox Christianity, built his whole political theory around the assumption that nature's God had endowed every human being with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Lincoln, likewise, might be filled with doubt about the intricacies of the creeds of Christian churches, but not about the existence of a fundamental natural law that everyone could understand. Appealing to this underlying natural law and the natural rights it equipped everyone with was a particularly important aspect of Lincoln's opposition to slavery. I am naturally anti-slavery, Lincoln said in 1864. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. Opposition to slavery came so immediately to Lincoln because slavery was, very simply, a gross outrage on the law of nature. It trampled on one of the great natural rights, the right to liberty, which Jefferson had spelled out in the Declaration of Independence. And that explained why a loathing for slavery amounted to human instinct. Have not all civilized nations our own among them, made the slave trade capital and classed it with piracy and murder? Lincoln demanded, is it not held to be the great wrong of the world? And not only human instinct recoiled at slavery. The ant who has toiled and dragged a crumb to his nest will furiously defend the fruit of his labor against whatever robber assails him. So plain that the most dumb and stupid slave that ever toiled for a master does constantly know that he is wronged. So plain that no one, high or low, ever does mistake it except in a plainly selfish way. For although volume upon volume is written to prove slavery a very good thing, we never hear of the man who wishes to take the good of it by being a slave himself. Still, like divinely revealed law, it was always possible for people to stop up their ears and refuse to hear what natural law was saying. And that was especially true when the voice of self-interest was chattering and telling them that slavery might not be what they wanted for themselves, but it was nevertheless perfectly suitable for inflicting on someone else. Lincoln attacked the old school Presbyterian minister, Frederick Augustus Ross, in 1858, after reading Ross's Slavery Ordained of God by asking whether self-interest hadn't gotten the better of Ross's understanding of both scripture and natural law. If he decides that God wills Sambo to continue a slave, he thereby retains his own comfortable position. But if he decides that God wills Sambo to be free, he thereby has to walk out of the shade, throw off his gloves, and delve for his own bread. Will Dr. Ross be actuated by that perfect impartiality which has ever been considered most favorable to correct decisions? One of the principal reasons that Lincoln thought slavery a great and crying injustice an enormous national crime for which we could not expect to escape punishment was the way it appealed to selfishness, and especially the selfishness of thoughtless and giddy-headed young men who looked upon work as vulgar and ungentlemanly. It did not surprise Lincoln then that slavery's defenders retaliated by denying the existence of any such natural right to liberty, or denied that it applied to black people, 
or denied that natural law had more authority than raw majority rule. No one, Lincoln insisted, had more reverence for majority rule, for popular democracy, and for government of the people, by the people, for the people, than he did. But democracy, Lincoln insisted, was a means, not an end in itself. And the rule of democratic majorities, which was the essence of democracy, did not have the power to revoke or to ignore natural law or natural rights. The proper sphere of democracy was in civil rights, in determining the civil privileges which the members of a community should enjoy, like voting. No majority, however, could ever be right in trying to veto someone's natural right to liberty. Unless, of course, they believed that there was no natural law in the first place and that all power emerged from whatever a majority at a given moment wanted to do. This was exactly what the defense of slavery became. In the hands of pro-slavery radicals like John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, Jefferson and the Declaration were held to have been a colossal mistake. All men are not created equal, Calhoun announced. Instead, then, of all men having the same right to liberty and equality, liberty and equality are merely social conventions to be handed out as high prizes to certain races in their most perfect state. But even comparatively moderate politicians, like Lincoln's old nemesis, Stephen A. Douglas, also denied that natural law had any authority over the will of a majority. And if that majority wanted to enslave black people, then so be it. Democracy, said Douglas, leaves the people to do just as they please and to shape their institutions according to what they may conceive to be their interests, both for the present and the future. Any state in the Union whose voters wanted a slave state constitution must, said Stephen Douglas, have a right to it. It is none of my business which way the slavery clause is decided. I care not whether it is voted down or voted up, so long as it is voted. Lincoln thought this was not only absurd, but dangerous. Mere majority rule cannot reverse natural law, natural rights, or natural institutions. In fact, it was the underlying substructure of natural rights which ensured that democracy would not go off the rails and spin off into some self-destructive abyss. Trying to override the natural rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness of other people by majority will, will eventually, Lincoln feared, leave you unprotected when the majority turns its unrestricted powers on you. Our defense, Lincoln said, is in the preservation of the spirit which prizes liberty as the heritage of all men in all lands everywhere, and not just liberty as some local statute which can be sent up or sent down by the next referendum. Destroy this spirit, Lincoln warned, and you have planted the seeds of despotism around your own doors. Familiarize yourself with the chains of bondage, and you are preparing your own limbs to wear them. Accustomed to trample on the rights of those around you, you have lost the genius of your own independence and become the fit subjects of the first cunning tyrant who rises. This was not necessarily a religious argument, per se. It might make the United States a nation under natural law, but not necessarily under God. And in the years between 1854 and 1860, as Lincoln gradually attracted national political attention, his references to God are sparse and coldly conventional when they do occur. Still, any appeal to natural law has religious overtones. Since the existence of a natural law 
implies a natural law giver. And even Jefferson felt compelled to frame his appeal to natural rights as the gift of nature's God. Lincoln did as much when he defined the spirit which prizes liberty as a natural love of liberty which God, God and not just natural law, has planted in our bosoms. And it has to be said, too, that the defenders of slavery interpreted Lincoln's natural law argument as little better than covert religion. Stephen Douglas understood very well that stopping to inquire into the sinfulness of slavery makes it a religious question. But as far as Douglas was concerned, that was precisely why appeals to natural law should be allowed no bearing whatsoever on the politics of slavery. The separation of church and state ruled out of bounds anything which looked like a religious argument in public life, even if all reference to God had been safely transmuted into that of nature's God. Religion, Douglas insisted, is intended to operate on our consciences and ensure the performance of our duties as individuals and Christians, but it has nothing to say about the form of government under which we live and the character of our political civil institutions. What did, however, shift the ground decisively under Lincoln's feet and move him from natural law to under God, was the experience of the Civil War. Like many a secular-minded optimist in the middle of the 19th century, Lincoln had a sublime confidence in the power of progress. But progress is precisely what the first 18 months of the Civil War offered no evidence of. Slavery, which ought to have been headed for the dustbin of history, had showed itself resourceful in wooing sympathy and aid from Britain and France. And the rebel armies had been victorious on one battlefield after another. By September of 1862, the main rebel army, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, had actually gone on the offensive in the war, crossed the Potomac River, and was poised to invade the North. It was at this point that Lincoln as was his habit, began trying to work this problem out on paper. And what he came up with was a series of private notes which sounded like a combination of theology and geometry. The will of God prevails, he wrote, as though he was stating an axiom in a theorem. And surely, if God really is God, his will must prevail, or he would not be God. In this war, both sides claim to act in accordance with the will of God, but neither has exactly achieved what would surely be the result, victory, which having the will of God on their side ought to produce. After all, God, by his mere quiet power on the minds of the now contestants, could have either saved or destroyed the Union without a human contest. But God had not only evidently willed that the war should begin, but that it should proceed in a direction that neither side had anticipated. That, for Lincoln, was proof enough that God's purpose is something different from the purpose of either party, something new that neither side had planned upon. And the unavoidable conclusion he had to draw from that was that the unplanned for result must be the emancipation of the slaves. But thinking in this fashion also held another message for Lincoln, and that was that God was not merely a remote force or a faceless universal power, but a personal, intelligent, and willing God who intervened in the affairs of men to direct them in ways that they could not even begin to imagine. Three weeks later, after Lee's army had been brought to battle at Antietam and driven back across the Potomac, Lincoln gave this realization an even sharper point 
when he laid before his cabinet the text of an emancipation proclamation, which by virtue of his powers as commander in chief would free every slave then in rebel hands. Once the rebels invaded Maryland, he explained to his assembled cabinet secretaries, I determined as soon as it should be driven out of Maryland to issue a proclamation of emancipation. And he had done so on the strength of what he called a promise he had made to myself and hesitating a little to my maker. The rebel army is now driven out and I am going to fulfill that promise. To the hard-bitten political veterans of his cabinet, nothing could have been more utterly surprising than to listen to a president announce that he was about to make the most important policy decision of his administration, and perhaps of American history, on the strength of his communications with the Almighty. But there it was. God had decided this question in favor of the slaves, Lincoln said. He was satisfied that it was right and was confirmed and strengthened in his action by the vow and the results. Lincoln sensed that God had moved in directions that could not easily be discerned, but which he was obliged to follow surfaced again and again in his letters and speeches over the remaining two and a half years of his life, and never more so than in the inaugural address he delivered after his re-election in 1864. Take the inaugural addresses of the previous 15 presidents together, and they contain little beyond the vaguest cliches about God blessing America. Not Lincoln's. His second inaugural address was almost a theological meditation on the nature of justice and how justice was a quality which God reserved to himself to measure. American slavery, he said, is an offense for which all Americans, North and South alike, stood in some measure guilty. And if God chooses to punish both sides for their complicity in slavery, and gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? In the face of a guilt in which all had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the only appropriate behavior for victors and vanquished alike was to conduct themselves with humility and repentance, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. We were all under the judgment of God, not just under the obligations of natural law, but under God. None of this it has to be said, necessarily made Abraham Lincoln a Christian, though many well-intentioned people after his death would invent well-intentioned stories, testifying that Lincoln had been converted or planned to join a church or confessed some private Christianity. The problem with all of those stories is that Christianity is not quiet. And the stubborn fact is that Lincoln never did join a church or make any kind of formal religious profession. His God was more the God of the Old Testament, more a judge than that of a New Testament redeemer. But if this did not make him a Christian per se, it did make him a good deal more than an infidel. 
There was, as Lincoln had discovered, a God who intervened, intervened in the affairs of men. And this was a God whom he wanted his nation to be under. Being under God would bring that nation to some surprising conclusions, especially about justice and mercy and forgiveness. But surprising conclusions, as Lincoln explained to a political ally a month before his death, surprising conclusions are part and parcel of belief in a living God. Men are not flattered by being shown that there has been a difference of purpose between the Almighty and them, Lincoln wrote. To deny it, however, in this case, is to deny that there is a God governing the world. It is a truth which I thought needed to be told. And as whatever of humiliation there is in it falls most directly on myself, I thought others might afford for me to tell it. Yours truly, A. Lincoln. Thank you very much. We have about 20 minutes for Q&A. If you raise your hand, we'll bring the mic to you. Why uh, Abraham Lincoln? What is it about him that you've invested so much time, energy, and passion in your life? What is it, what, what makes you tick? <laughs> because there are depths in the man for an elephant to swim in. Lincoln was a man of modest, extremely modest education. He came from very modest circumstances. And that sometimes decoyed people into thinking that he was a man of modest attainments. That was a big mistake. Leonard Sweat, I mentioned Leonard Sweat earlier as a lawyer who had practiced law with Lincoln on the old Eighth Judicial Circuit in Illinois. Leonard Sweat, writing about Lincoln, said, anybody who took Abe Lincoln for a simple-minded man would soon wake up with his back in a ditch. <laughs> there were a lot of people who wound up in that ditch. Sometimes it was other lawyers. There was one occasion, Sweat delighted in, in describing this, there was one occasion in which Lincoln was facing off against a lawyer in a case, and Lincoln began, as was his habit, his strategy, by saying that he reckoned, this is in the opening statement that he's making as a lawyer in the case, he reckoned that he could concede the first point in this case to opposing counsel, and he reckoned that he could concede the second point in this case to opposing counsel, and he went, you know, he reckoned, he always reckoned this, you know, thumbs under the suspenders. He reckoned he could give away the third or the fourth or the fifth. And, of course, you know, opposing counsel is sitting over there swelling up like a bullfrog, thinking, oh, well, I've got it all over this, this backwoods rube. I don't know where they got this guy Lincoln from, but he's going to be a pushover. That was until Lincoln got to the sixth and last element in the case, which Lincoln had already understood was the key element in the case. Lincoln gave away the first five, said Sweat, because he knew they were unimportant, and besides, he couldn't make anything out of them anyway. But that sixth one he waited for, and that sixth one he then wrapped around opposing counsel's neck like bar iron. Lincoln was so skilled in the stating of the opening of the case that on one occasion a judge interrupted him halfway through and said, all right, Brother Lincoln, now we have heard you. Let's hear from the other side. It was said that Lincoln could almost win a case just by the way he would describe it in the opening statements. On one occasion, a lawyer friend of his, Archie Williams, was walking with another lawyer down the hallway of a courtroom in which Lincoln was holding forth in a, in a patent case. And the patent case involved a, a large model of the particular invention that was being contested in the case. And Lincoln was trying to explain all the inner workings of this. They stopped and they watched Lincoln. 
And then Lincoln got the jury out of the box to come down and come and look at this model and got them all to get down on all fours and look at how the thing was doing. At that point, Archie Williams says, well, Lincoln's got that case in his back pocket. Look, he's got the jury down on their knees in front of him. <laughs> no, he was, he was a man of surprising and subtle intellect, much, much better read than people gave him credit for. He was a master of words, words that he took into himself. He had learned in hard fashioning, like a blacksmith hammering, how to communicate with people. And of course, being a lawyer in central Illinois in those days honed that to razor sharpness because he's, he's conducting law in these little county courthouses where the jury is, is called from farmers and whatnot standing in the back of the, of the courtroom. And you know very well, you're either going to make your case very, very clear to those people very quickly, or you're going to be looking for a new line of work fairly soon. He learned how to state something so clearly that you could not argue with it. One woman who was a witness to the Lincoln-Douglas debates, listening to Douglas and then listening to Lincoln, she said, if you listened if you listen to Douglas talk, if you listen to him for a little while, if you listen to him for five minutes, Douglas with his drama, his passion, his charisma, shaking his head with a vast mane of black hair, you were bowled over by Douglas. Then if you listen to Lincoln, who spoke in a high, reedy, tenor voice, well, it wasn't beautiful to listen to. Lincoln didn't sound like a great opera star, but the way he would state the case would be so logical and so irrefutable, he'd have the hook in your mouth and he would just reel you right in. And if you listened to Lincoln for half an hour, you were finished, you were with Lincoln, you couldn't argue with him. That was how Lincoln conducted things. Even at the very end of his life, at the Great Hampton Roads Conference, where three commissioners from the Confederacy came to consult with him and with Secretary of State Seward, one of the Confederate commissioners protested at, at the, uh, as the conference was moving along. Lincoln, if we accept the way you're describing this war and our participation in it, then we would have to say that we are all guilty of treason. Well, Senator, said Lincoln, you stated it better than I could. There was a sharpness to the man that provides no end of fascination. To read his words is to read how he lays out. And yet, this is not merely a sophisticated, sharpy lawyer. This is a man with a profound dedication to principles, to ideas, and especially ideas about democracy and integrity and liberty and freedom. Ideas which we all stand in the shadow of and we, which we all can profit from reading and learning from. One goes back to Lincoln almost as one goes back to a fountain to drink. So why Lincoln? I think for all of those reasons. There is simply, there is simply no bottom to the man. The more you study him, the taller he grows. Thank you. Uh, in your book, Redeemer President, you called Lincoln a Calvinistic deist. Would you like to expand upon that? Well, I suppose I've already made some allusion to that. He was raised in a, in a very Calvinistic environment. His parents belonged to a predestinarian Baptist church whose doctrine of predestination was so stark it would make your hair stand on end. I mean, he, they, they out Calvin Calvin. I mean, they, wouldn't, they would not sanction sending missionaries to the heathen because if, if the heathen were going to get converted, God would do it in his own good time and by his will, thank you, he didn't require any second instrumentalities. Uh, that, that's probably pushing it a bit. But that was the environment in which Lincoln is, is formed. And while he rejects the formal outlines of that, the thumbprint of it stays with him. He will always be, as he describes himself, a fatalist. 
He is always going to quote those lines from Hamlet. There's a divinity that shapes our end, rough hew it as we will. And he is constantly talking about how I deserve no credit for the shape of things and the direction of policy in the Civil War. In April of 1864, he had an interview with the Kentucky newspaper man, Albert Hodges, and the governor of Kentucky, Thomas Bramlett, in which he says, I, I'm, I affect no compliment to myself. Um, I, I have merely been the observer of these great events. I am not a starter of them. I have merely cooperated with them and been pushed along by them. So he carries with him that sense that his ancestral Calvinism imparted to him of the inevitability of events, the logic of events. And he weds that to this kind of generalized deism that doesn't want to embrace any formal or conventional Christianity, it wants to acknowledge God in the distance, but it's a God who looks an awful lot like the Westminster Confession. Uh, there, there are bits and pieces that are, that are simply woven together in him. Is it consistent? No. But then again, he's not a consistent thinker. He's not, what, I, I'm, what I mean by that is he's not, a, he's not a philosopher, he's not a theologian. Sometimes we try to press Lincoln to be that. We want him to be a professor of, of something or other and to, and to have every line connect to every other line that he writes and says and thinks. But he's not. He's a politician. He's a lawyer. And you have to understand that there are going to be some things which are swirling around in the midst of his thinking, which don't always hook up easily to the other parts. But there were a lot of those pieces notwithstanding. And you can, without too much difficulty, discern how much of an impress was made on his mind very early on when he talked about necessity in a way that could sound very passive. To him, it was actually something of a source of confidence and strength. On one occasion in the White House, Leonard Sweat, to come back to, to Sweat again, Leonard Sweat, whom, whom Lincoln often tabbed to do personal embassy of, of sorts on Lincoln's behalf, Sweat had, had become very despondent over the course of the war. And Sweat went to Lincoln and confessed his, his despair. Lincoln said, no, no. He, uh, Lincoln, he said, got out a little notebook from his frock coat. And this little notebook was full of things Lincoln had collected and snipped out of newspapers and almanacs and whatnot, odds and ends of information, which probably would not make a whole lot of sense to us if we, if we saw it. But which he said, all right, here, you see how this leads to this, this leads to this, this leads to the other, how these are all working together. And it's going to guarantee the inevitability of this result. You know, Lincoln's sense of confidence, at the very, toward the very end of the war, Ulysses Grant asked Lincoln straight up, did you ever have a moment when you doubted that the war could be won? And Lincoln said, never once. That strength is itself a reflection of that predestination, that sense that everything is ordered in a particular direction by an intelligent will. That, that sense, however watered down it is in Lincoln, that sense was a very important part of the man, and it shows up time and again. I really enjoyed your talk, by the way. I'm so glad. I was, I was getting worried there. I was giving you a compliment. <laughs> oh, all right, good, <laughs> because good. I, I would ask a question that's maybe a little bit off topic, but I'd be interested to know to what degree does Lincoln stand in continuity with the founders, and to what degree do you think he deviates from it? Oh, he's the founder's son. I mean, if the founders are the fathers, he's, he's the son. He is, he is the one who, on the one hand, brings to completion the project of the founders. I mean, the founders give us the declaration. They give us the Constitution. But they were not gods. They did not produce absolutely perfect documents. And the Constitution not only was not a perfect document, we had to amend it right away in the form of the Bill of Rights. 
But its principal birthmark was, was, was slavery. And you might say it was its principal birth defect. And it is Lincoln who is more than anyone else responsible for surgically removing that defect, that, as he himself sometimes compared it to, a tumor in the body politic. He removes from the reputation of the American Republic and the American founders that, that one great major oversight, which was dealing with human slavery. So he brings that project, he brings the project of the founders to fruition. But understand at the same time, it is the founders project he's a, he, he is about. He is extremely conscious of what he owes constitutionally to the founders. In 1848, he once made the comment, let's not even talk about amending the Constitution because we really couldn't do better than the founders have done. That, doctrine is, is, that document is as near perfect as it can be. Let's not talk about amending it. Well, of course, he is responsible for amending it in the form of the 13th Amendment, which only means, you know, be careful what you wish for. But at the same time, when he moves that way, he is moving in a constitutional way, in a way the Constitution provides, to amend it. He's not trying to overthrow the Constitution. In fact, when Salmon Chase, his, his very pious uh, Secretary of the Treasury, presses him in September of 1863 to expand the application of the Emancipation Proclamation beyond the strictly military aspects of it that Lincoln had as a justification for it originally uh, at the beginning of 1863, Lincoln responds to Chase and he says, I can't do that. He said, I'd like to do it. That's my personal preference. But I can't do it. I mean, I'm only the President of the United States. And he says, what's, what, what's more, if, if I were to go beyond what the Constitution permits me to do, would I not be in the boundless field of despotism? Would I not be giving away exactly the principles that we're fighting for? We're fighting to, to preserve the Constitution. What else is the Southern Confederacy but a gigantic assault on the Constitution? We're fighting to preserve it. We can't then ourselves begin to adopt tactics that would make us no better than the people uh, who we are opposing. So he's, he's constantly insisting we can't go outside that. And the ultimate proof of this comes in 1864 when he stands for re-election. All right, this is 1864. We're in the middle of a civil war. If there would be anybody who would have had a justification at any time, anywhere, or any place in American history to say, look, we've got an emergency here, folks. Um, we, we can't dissolve our energies into a presidential election campaign, much less take the risk of how it might turn out. Well, we can't. So we're, we're going to suspend elections for this year, 1864. We're just not going to have them this year, and I'll, I'll rule on my own authority until things seem to have straightened up. He could have said that. And he would have had one powerful argument for doing it, too. One, persuasive, one big, fat, persuasive argument for doing it, too. He doesn't. He runs all the risks of re-election. In fact, the risks are so real that by the end of August 1864, he's actually convinced he's going to lose the election. But he never once tries to push a button that says, let the election stop so I can stay in office. And he says, on the day after he's re-elected, he says, we had, to, we had to do it this way because we, we can't have a republic without elections. <laughs> Because if we suspended the elections, it would be like giving away the whole game to the Confederacy. We would have been saying, in effect, they are winning. So he is the man who helps us to perfect our Constitution, not to overthrow it, not to replace it. He helps us to realize it, but he also saves it. Because what do we emerge with at the end of the Civil War? We are still the same United States. We are still governed under the same Constitution. We're still functioning under the same laws and the same rules that we had before, and we're continuing to function under that same Constitution today. Who saved that Constitution for us? Abraham Lincoln. Do you suppose that if we had lost the Civil War, we would still have the United States Constitution as it is? Do you suppose that the Confederacy had established its independence 
that the rump of what was left of the United States would simply have said, oh, well, obviously that Constitution from 1787 didn't work. We're going to have to write a new one. No. He saves the Constitution for us today. The reason we have a Constitution today is in very large measure because of Abraham Lincoln. So that, in a very long way, is my answer about Abraham Lincoln, who I will insist is preeminently our constitutional president. Um, unfortunately, that concludes our time today as it's 1 p.m. Um, so one more round of applause for Dr. Gelder. Thank you very much.